Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General, and welcome to our video on the new vampire count mechanic of Bloodlines. Now, earlier in the week, we had the announcements that we'd be getting the Bloodline mechanic. I maybe jumped to an overly optimistic view that this might mean we will get some of the most legendary of the vampire count lords, those who founded the different Bloodlines in the vampire count society. But that seems not to be the case. It seems like the mechanic, although interesting, will just allow us access to certain generic lords from each of these bloodlines. And there was a stream after that announcement, but I hadn't had a chance to see it by the time I started recording my last video on it. So I thought I'd go through the whole thing in a bit of detail for those of you who perhaps didn't want to sit through, I think it was about a two hour stream they did, and just want the kind of summary of what the mechanic is about. So, let's get on with it, shall we? When we get the update in November for the Vampire Count, we will see a screen not unlike this one. When we click in the bottom right-hand corner on this symbol, and this will pull up the Bloodline screen. Now, this is a very interesting mechanic whereby you're basically selecting a Lord or General with a little bit more oomph. And to get these generals, you need to have a secondary currency known as Blood Kisses. The idea being, I think, you do certain things, and then you convert people to a bloodline. I think that's the idea of the lore behind it. Um, the Blood Kiss was a way of transferring or making a new vampire in the Warhammer lore. So that's the currency you use to get these new lords when you recruit them. Now you get Blood Kisses, which are tracked in the top center here of the screen, as you see by the open mouth with fangs there. And you get them through killing other lords, through a variety of different tasks really. And then you, as you amass them, you're able to recruit these higher tier generals. Now as we can see at the beginning, before you've recruited any of them, it appears as though they will cost three Blood Kisses each. And now we know they'll get progressively more expensive as we go along. As we can see here, once they've recruited one of the Necrarch generals, then the next one to recruit will cost six Blood Kisses. Now will that double to 12 or will that go to nine for the next one? We don't know as of this moment, but we will know it will get more expensive. So that's the way that's going to work. Now these Lords are a little bit better than the general sort of vanilla Lords you get in the recruitment of the Vampire Counts. You'll also get certain faction bonuses and these are defined at the bottom of each of these family bloodline trees here just beneath the awaken sign now these bonuses vary and later on in the video we'll go over each of them for each of the bloodlines now in all you can only have three generals from any one bloodline as you can see here by the limited amount of slots now really that's plenty for almost any army to conquer most of the warhammer world as it stands at the moment maybe with one or two vanilla lords thrown in there as well now when you've selected to awaken one of these lords they'll be very easily findable if you go to your general recruitment tab and you'll see them here highlighted in purple these are the ones from the special bloodline although i think it's a bit mean that they cost you that blood kiss and they also cost you money to recruit as well but 825 isn't much so that's pretty understandable there have also been some other changes to the vampire counts i just thought i'd go over briefly there appear to be some work done on the research tree with some of the more notable things coming in the book of arkan whereby you'd be able to actually research enough where skeletons and zombies wouldn't cost you any upkeep at all so that's a huge bonus and would be great to encourage you to build up just these massive chaff armies to throw at the enemy and the idea they said behind this was to make something akin to the way the tombkins play just allowing you to build up these chaff armies for really no cost of upkeep and have them rampage around the world maybe just backing up a proper army to overwhelm the enemy with numbers i kind of like that idea and it'll add something very different to the gameplay there's also been a couple of changes to the building tree for the vampire counts mainly the thing they highlighted was that heroes have been kind of moved down the building tree you'll be able to recruit vampire count heroes a little bit earlier you'll be able to recruit the necromancer from a level two building you'll be able to recruit the white king from a level two building as well so just making them a bit more accessible earlier on in the campaign having said
said that, let's have a look at the faction bonuses you can get from awakening each of these generals in these bloodlines. So let's start with the Lamians, whose master is of course Neferata, and in a way I suppose all vampires are Lamians to a certain extent, in that their master was the first ever vampire in the Warhammer world. But she got sick of the world of men being looked over by Nagash, ignored by Vlad. She went on to form her own coven of mainly female vampires, and they have a huge spy network. But they don't seem to have focused so much on the spy network, and rather, as we see from the first bonus here, you get a minus 50% upkeep for all heroes. That's a pretty big bonus, faction-wide. Just make sure you have as many heroes as you can get into your army, they'll cost you half as much. The next one up for the Lamians is a bigger loss reduction to medium for all armies and keeping that minus 50% upkeep for all heroes. The third one is basically a campaign line of sight, 150%. Now this is the only one that one could maybe argue speaks to that spy network aspect, allowing you to see further, have a better idea of what's going on in the world around you. The next one's up are the Von Karsteins, and their first bonus for recruiting their legendary lord is a plus 20% casualty replenishment rate, pretty huge, and something very unique to the vampire counts, they will be able to recruit crossbowmen. Now, a lot of people will be up in arms about this, about the idea of a Vampire Count army having crossbowmen. It goes against the tabletop game, it goes against a few other things, but it actually kind of agrees with the lore to a certain extent. The Von Karsteins overlook what is essentially, and at times, claiming independent Empire province. And they don't kill everyone in the province. It's not like Nehekara, where everyone died because of an accident of Nagash's magic. It is that they do have living subjects who the vampires feast upon. It's just kind of a very oppressive place where children go missing in the night and all sorts of nasty business happens and the people are so jaded they don't ask too many questions, just go along with it. So the idea that they'd have human servants and who would serve in their armies actually kind of goes along with the way they do things. Now it could be argued that human society and the raising of corpses were kept separate by the vampires and that the humans weren't necessarily aware that all of their masters were vampires and maybe just suspected it, but that's for another side. I kind of like the idea of just giving these lords that little bit extra. So that's a pretty good bonus for their first lord there. The second one is all of that stuff we mentioned before with a plus five public order bonus for all provinces. Again, pretty handy. And then the third one is all of those, but they also get access to handgunners with their armor-piercing damage. So it would make this guy's armies and all of the free generals that he has um, just a very interesting sort of little army to build for your Vampire Count campaign, really adding something very different than what we've had from the Vampire Counts before. Moving on to the one I know a lot of you are most excited about, the Blood Dragons, whose master is Aberash. Let's have a look at what the Blood Dragons can do. The first one is plus 10% for cavalry units, all armies. Great bonus, beneficial, particularly maybe later game once you get many more Blood Knights in your armies. Next one is that, plus 100 experience for all units in all armies. That's a great one. That's a huge buff. Like Vlad himself as a legendary lord, but would give your army that. And those of you who have played a campaign with Vlad will know that that is huge. And by the end, all your guys have full gold chevrons much earlier on than you would as any other legendary lord. And having this as plus 100 across all armies is a pretty great buff bonus. The third one is you are immune to untainted attrition, uh, which is great. It allows you to have the thing that now Kemler's faction will have, where he can just move across territories without worrying about them being corrupted with vampiric corruption anymore. All in all, some great ones there, but maybe not the most powerful um, if you look at all the rest in comparison. Now, the Blood Dragons, we've actually had a bit more information on rather than just their bonuses from awakening each of their particularly unique generals. What we have from them is we have a way they look. Now, this general in particular had a huge fin. I apologize for the quality of the picture. It's the best I could rip from the stream. Um, but he has two swords. He has a massive red fin for a helmet going across the back of his head, in fact impractically large, but he has a huge amount of weapon strength, as you can see from his stat card there on the side. Uh, he'll also be able to uh, mount a zombie dragon, as we were given a look into his upgrade tree. 
Now, in the upgrade tree, all of these lords that you unlock when you awaken them will automatically come with the immortality trait. So they'll have that from the off. If they get killed in battle or someone attempts to assassinate them, they will always come back, which is a great bonus. There's many things we've seen here before, but it's worth pointing out a couple of things. Magic for many of the Vampire Count Lords has changed to a system much more akin to that of Total War Warhammer 2, where you can get magic spells by spending uh, less skill points. You don't have to double down just to get the overcast, spending two skill points almost on each spell. It looks like they've done away with that to a much more familiar Warhammer 2 system. And also, from the Blood Dragon bloodline, we have this line at the top which we'll go through now. So, Doom Rider is minus 50% construction for binding circle chain buildings. Uh, minus 1 construction time for those buildings as well. Minus 50% upkeep for Black Knight units. That's a pretty great bonus. And of course, minus 1 recruitment time. The strength of steel, plus 20 armor, plus 25 armor piercing, plus 22 anti-large. Great buff for the, for the fighting general. Heart piercing is a temporary buff for plus 40% armor piercing and plus 36% charge bonus. Great little one there. Now, I think if I remember the stream correctly, they said you may have to pick between these two choices. You can either go down the Doom Rider chain, or you can go down this Grave Sentinels chain, depending on which one you prefer. Now, the Grave Sentinels is a minus 40% upkeep on Grave Guard units, minus 50% for recruitment for Grave Guard units, minus one to their recruitment time. And then we have the Disciple of Aberash, minus 20% 20, uh, 20 missile resistance and 10% physical resistance, and honor or death, a bonus to leadership and damage resistance. So it looks like you can go down one of those two chains. The other one I thought we'd have a look at is the Ordo Draconis. Minus 40% upkeep for Blood Knights, minus 40% recruitment cost for them, and a minus one for their recruitment time. Very similar to the Grave Sentinels and the Black Knight one we saw before in the previous upgrade line. As you can see, also with a Zombie Dragon, can be a potentially devastating fighting lord here. So, moving on from the Blood Dragons, let's go on to the Necrarchs. Now, from the Necrarchs, we get the Necrarch Gifts. Now, plus 25% research rate. Early Doors, that would be a great bonus to get. That's a huge one, and may be people's first choice. Not because he's a great lord, but because of that bonus and what it means for you in the long term. These guys tend to focus on sorcery, so that's where all their skills are based. But let's continue going down their awakening skills that they bring to the whole faction. They also do plus 20 for Winds of Magic, all armies. And then the next one up will add a minus 10% upkeep for all units, all armies. That's a pretty great uh, line of upgrades. Very useful all around. So this is what these guys look like. You can kind of see there are recycled elements from the necromancers and the heads of vampires. Kind of all mixed in here. Um, they actually said on the stream that they kind of just chopped and changed to make these guys. Not a lot of unique assets going into making these particular generals. So having had a look at him, let's go and have a look at his upgrade tree. A lot of stuff we've seen before. You guys will recognize a lot of it he too can get on a zombie dragon if he wants also that immortality which we spoke about earlier now sinisher uh, seems to be a base a boost to his magic casting ability and that looks pretty helpful as well and then the rest we kind of recognize we've seen most of them before a kind of hybrid mix of magics here but the one we haven't seen perhaps is nekara noble blood and that's again m lowering the miscast chance uh, minus two for the cost of invocation and spell uses plus two for raised dead and the raised dead upgraded version all pretty handy he also has a boosted version of the Arcane Conduit, and it seems to be a constant effect rather than a temporary boost to your magic pool, which is great. And that's about it for the Necrarch bloodline. Uh, powerful wizards, a lot of great spells there for them to take advantage of. Um, that's kind of their angle in this bloodline mechanic. Last but by no means least, we have the Strigoi. Now the first Strigoi upgrade is a plus 20% ambush success chance. The next one he gets is plus 
plus 5 vampiric corruption. And the next one after that is a minus 60% penalty due to lack of corruption presence. So that means these guys give you a boost to being able to go through and colonize uh, units, expand a little bit quicker as vampire counts. That seems to be the bonus they get you without having huge public order penalties when you take over a place with virtually no or no vampiric corruption. It is a little bit of choice that you have to come to here. I like that. It sort of makes you think, do you want to spread it across all the first skills? Do you want to sort of really plow into one bloodline primarily and then move on to the others to get those higher level skills? Uh, it's really adding a very interesting element. And although the Lords are mainly kind of recycled and generic for the most part, they are slightly unique enough looking to make them a bit different than the vanilla Vampire Count Lords we've been dealing with since Total War Warhammer 1. So for me, all round, it's not quite what we hoped for, but it is very interesting and does very much change the way we play through a Vampire Count campaign. And it also, you know, it doesn't rule out things for the future. So potentially later on down the line, when we do have some people like Neferata and Aberash perhaps added into the game, Game, this is the mechanic by which they'd be introduced when you get that third upgraded lord you get one of the founders of the bloodline re-emerging into your army that would be a cool little way of introducing them spreading them out not just having to carry out um, a banal sort of quest to unlock them in your general recruitment tree but you know just really having to earn it by getting those blood kisses perhaps adding another layer onto this for a fourth one really making it hugely expensive as far as blood kisses are concerned so i'm really excited for it um it's maybe not what we all hoped for but it's pretty good and it adds a really different element to the way we play vampire counts so a great addition to the campaign and i can't wait to get my hands on it and see how it feels for the vampire counts all right guys that's about it for me i hope if you haven't heard this information before this was good for you and gave you a bit of a better idea about how all the mechanics of the bloodlines will work when we get the update in november other than that guys as always a huge thank you for watching and i'll catch you all on the next one